Hi everybody, Jonathan here. In this video, I will be giving you my take on section 3.5, which is all about implicit differentiation. Now, I really enjoy implicit differentiation because it really uses this powerful idea in math that you don't actually have to calculate something in order to do awesome things with it. Instead, you just have to know that it's possible to calculate it. And implicit differentiation is a great example of this. So the book started with uh, with this really interesting graph um, called, what, the folium of Descartes. And if you have the equation x cubed plus y cubed equals 6xy, it turns out that the set of solutions looks like this little loopy thing. And that's well and nice, but you're like, hey man, I remember pre-calc, and that thing doesn't even pass the vertical line test. So it does not define y as a function of x. It also doesn't pass the horizontal line test, so it doesn't pass, define x is a function of y. And yeah, that's definitely true. It doesn't define y as one function of x. However, by restricting to different pieces of the graph, it defines several functions where y is a function of x. And the book does it in this kind of awkward way, but if you just take this parts of the graph, that now passes the vertical line test, and we've got y as a function of x. Then there's this other part here. It doesn't pass the it does pass the vertical line test, and we got y as a function of x. And finally, this part here, just taken from the graph over here, again it passes the vertical line test and defines y as a function of x. So the choices they made, they've got three different functions, and they could have made other function other choices. Like I don't particularly like how this is disjoint, but whatever. So we've got these different functions, and we still don't know what y is, but the amazing thing about implicit differentiation is, is that even without finding y, we can still find y's derivative. And even better, the same calculation is going to give us the derivative of all these different functions we've defined. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit, but I kind of got super excited when I realized that I could actually make graphs like this on my own in Desmos. So I made this graph in Desmos. It's the same graph as you were just looking at. However, here is the function bx cubed plus cy cubed equals axy. And by using these sliders, we can change the values of a, b, and c. So right now, it's the same as the function that was in the book, namely x cubed, where b is 1, plus cy cubed, where c is 1, plus axy, where a is 3. Um, however, by moving these sliders, we can see what happens as you allow these to change. So, for example, making A get bigger makes the loop bigger, which I enjoy. Making B get bigger does all sorts of funky things. Making C get bigger kind of does the same thing as B getting bigger. So, that's all pretty fun. And then you kind of ask, well, what are some other crazy functions we can define implicitly? And like when I was a kid, we only could graph where y was a function of x. We couldn't have all this implicitly defined functions. And now, thanks to programs like Desmos, you can. So you can get so many cooler graphs. So I'll hide that one and we'll show this one. So this is uh, the function ax cubed plus px squared plus cxy equals sine y for various values of a, b, and c. And we can move these sliders around and look at what interesting things you get. So that's, uh, I don't know, it's just kind of crazy. We get those different loops. So which one do we like the best? I don't know. How about that one? Of course, what happens if we zoom out? So this is a very cool looking graph. And once again, this graph defines many functions. It doesn't define one function because it doesn't pass the vertical line test. But every possible way that you could take a little snip of this graph and have it pass the vertical line test, that defies, defines y as a function of x. So for example, we could go from this point over to this point about, and that would define one part. Or you could take the top half of this little loop, or the bottom half, and so on and so on and so on. Here we're defining so many different functions, and by using implicit differentiation, we'll get the derivatives of all those functions all at once. Now this next one I got out of the book, um, where it had a and b just being one, but 
you get something truly amazing when you take a cosine of x minus b sine y and set that equal to sine of c y minus sine x for various values of a, b, and c. Um, and then as we move the sliders around, we can like look at all the crazy things that happen. So these loops appear to be somewhat parallel, sort of like sine waves, but as the a gets smaller, well, when a is close to zero, we get the most interesting behavior. And then when we move B around, it's really fun to watch the graphs morph into different things. Whoa, that was crazy. Ooh, I like, made little Pac-Mans. That's so exciting. Like, it's hard to believe that you get this. I mean, this is like a really, I don't know, maybe I'm just a nerd, but like, I think this is really neat um, finding these uh, different shapes. And then we'll try moving C around. So, wow. Like, it's just so cool. And then if you want to, you can come along and use, I'll put a link to this, and you can try your own implicit functions um, and feel welcome to use the, the values of A, B, and C to get them to change. Now, as crazy as this is, as you zoom out, you can see that this goes on forever and ever and ever. And we are defining infinitely many functions here. This graph when you extend it to all the, the, all the coordinate plane, you've defined infinitely many different functions, or y is some function of x. And yet, by using implicit differentiation, we'll be able to find all of the derivatives all at once, even though it is impossible to actually solve this thing for y. Um, one last thing I want to note here, for this crazy-looking graph, it's defined by this crazy-looking expression where it's impossible to solve it for y. But even though you can't solve it for y, it still defines y as a function of x because it defines a graph. And a graph, once it passes the vertical line test, once you've taken a small enough piece of it, defines y as a function of x. So how do we actually do implicit differentiation? So we always consider y to be some function of x, and we differentiate with respect to x. Since y is a function of x, in any expression that contains y's, we can therefore use the chain rule. Just like when you had f of g of x, and you would have to say the derivative is f prime of g of x times g prime of x. If you have f of y, when you differentiate with respect to x, the derivative has to be f prime of y times y prime. Again, just the chain rule. So some tips to keep in mind when you try to do this is that the derivative of y is always just y prime. By the chain rule, any derivative of a function of y, say f of y, is f prime of y times y prime. If you start mixing and, mixing and matching x's and y's, then you're going to have to do things like the product or quotient rule. So for example, if you had x times y and you just had to take the derivative, by the product rule, it's x times the derivative of y, which is y prime, plus the derivative of x, which is 1, times y. Um, now, the idea here is we want to solve for y prime, because once we've solved for y prime, then we'll get the derivative. After you differentiate, you're always going to get what I call a linear equation in y prime, which means that it's going to be a sum of terms, some of which have y prime in it and some of which don't. But there won't be anything like y prime squared or the square root of y prime. It'll always just be stuff times y prime or just stuff. Now, to solve that equation for y prime, you distribute away your parentheses, you get all the terms with y prime on one side of the equation and all the terms without y prime on the other side by adding or subtracting to both sides of the equation, like normal. Then you can factor out the y prime from all the terms with y prime, and then you divide both sides of the equation by whatever the stuff that is being multiplied by y prime is. So we're going to illustrate this with an example. So we're going to find y prime if we know that sine of x times y is equal to e to the y. So the first step is to differentiate both sides of the equation. So on the sine of x, y, we're going to have to use the product and chain rules. So the derivative of sine is cosine, so we get a cosine of x, y. But then by the chain rule, we have to multiply it by the derivative of what was inside the sine, which is x times y. And as we just noted above, the derivative of x times y is x, y prime plus y, all in parentheses. Now, by the tip 2, where the derivative of f of y is f prime of y, y prime, we get that the derivative of e to the y is e to the y times y prime, because the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Now we distribute away the parentheses, which means I just have to multiply this cosine of x, y into each term inside these parentheses, 
which gives us that cosine of xy times xy prime plus cosine of xy times y is equal to e to the y times y prime. So now I'm going to put all the terms with y prime on the left-hand side of the equation and all the terms without y prime on the right-hand side. So when I look over this, I see that this is the only term without y prime. So I subtract it from both sides of the equation. That'll cancel it from the left and make it minus on the right. So we get a minus cosine of xy times y on the right. And then I want to move this term with y prime over to the other side of the equation. So I will subtract it from both sides of the equation, which will eliminate it from the right-hand side and add a minus e to the y, y prime on the left-hand side. Now every term in the left-hand side has a y prime in it, and therefore you can factor y prime out. This gives the equation y prime times the quantity of cosine of xy times x minus e to the y, end parenthesis, is equal to minus cosine of xy times y. And now finally to finish it, we divide by whatever is being multiplied by y prime. At this point, there is only one prime. You can solve by dividing by what y prime is being multiplied by. So in this case, we divide both sides by cosine xy x minus e to the y and get our final answer of y prime equaling minus cosine of xy times y, all divided by cosine of xy times x minus e to the y.